Chapter Twenty One of With Cortez in Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. With Cortez in Mexico by George Alfred Henty. Chapter Twenty One A Victim for the Gods. The street which the Spaniards entered after leaving the causeway intersected the city from north to south it was broad and perfectly straight and from the roofs of the houses which lined it a storm of missiles was poured on the spaniards as they advanced cortez set the allies to work to level the houses as fast as the spaniards won their way along the street this they did until they reached the first canal the bridge here had been broken down and after the indians had crossed the temporary planks were pulled after them and they joined their countrymen behind a solid rampart of stone erected on the other side of the canal it was not until after two hours hard fighting and the use of artillery that this obstacle was cleared away and the spaniards wading across the canal pressed forward without further resistance until they reached the great square on one side of which stood the palace they had so long occupied the aztecs disheartened at the manner in which all the defences on which they relied had been captured by the spaniards and by their presence in the heart of the city for some time desisted from their efforts but they were roused to fury as a body of spaniards rushed up the winding terraces to the summit of the great temple and hurled the priests from its summit then with a yell of fury they threw themselves upon their enemies their headlong rush swept the spaniards back into the square when they were attacked by bodies of natives pouring down every street for once the spaniards lost their presence of mind fell into disorder and were swept before the torrent down the street which they had just traversed in vain cortez attempted to stem the stream the panic spread to the allies and the whole mass were flying before the natives when a body of cavalry came up and plunged into the crowd the natives were shaken by the appearance of the enemies they feared so much and cortez taking advantage of the confusion rallied his followers and again drove the aztecs back into the square night was now at hand and dragging off the cannon which had been abandoned in their flight the force marched off in good order though hotly pressed by the natives and retired to zolac alvarado and sandoval also succeeded in crossing their respective causeways but neither of them could penetrate into the city the attack had failed but it had strengthened the position of the spaniards for seeing the speedy manner in which they had overcome all the defences erected by the mexicans many of the cities which had hitherto stood aloof now sent in their submission and supplied levies to assist them in their work while ixtilzoquetl who had now become lord of tezcuco and was a strong adherent of the spaniards brought up a force of fifty thousand tezcucans who were divided among the three armies another simultaneous attack was now made the advance along the causeway being as before covered by the ships but the enemy fought stoutly and some hours elapsed before the spaniards again entered the city the advance was now more easy than on the previous occasion owing to the destruction of the buildings bordering the streets the natives however still fought with the greatest obstinacy but the great square was at last reached thinking to discourage the natives by the destruction of some of the principal edifices cortez ordered the palace which had served as the former barracks to be set on fire as also the house of birds adjoining montezuma's palace and those were soon a mass of flames the aztecs however were infuriated rather than intimidated and the fight raged with greater fury than ever having accomplished his object cortez again gave the order to fall back and covered by the cavalry retired down the street so desperately assailed by the natives that but few men reached the fort unwounded 
Day after day the same tactics were repeated, the Mexicans every night repairing the breaches, cleared out every day by the Spanish allies. Cortez found it impossible to guard the causeway and prevent this, the soldiers being already overcome by the fatigue of their daily encounters. Alvarado's division, however, held at night the ground they won in the daytime. But the troops suffered dreadfully from the incessant toil and from the rain, which poured down in torrents. The soldiers of Cortez fared little better, for the buildings in the fort of Zolak afforded shelter but to few, and the rest had to sleep on the causeway in its rear, exposed to all the tempestuous weather. Frequently, too, they were called up to battle, for the Aztec emperor, contrary to the usual practice of his countrymen, frequently attacked by night, often making simultaneous attacks on the three divisions on the causeways, while at the same moment troops from the neighboring towns attacked their camps in the rear. He did not content himself with open attacks, but resorted to stratagem. On one occasion he had a large number of canoes in ambuscade among some tall reeds bordering the lake. Several large boats then rowed near the Spanish vessels, Believing that they were filled with provisions intended for the city, two of the smaller vessels pursued them. The Aztec boats made for the reeds. The Spaniards followed, and presently struck upon submerged timbers the Indians had driven in. They were instantly attacked by the whole fleet of canoes. Most of the men were wounded, and several, including the two captains, slain, and one of the Spanish craft captured. It was now three months since the siege had begun, and the attitude of the Mexicans was as bold and defiant as ever. Several attempts which Cortez had made to open negotiations with the young emperor had been received with scorn. It was certain that, sooner or later, famine would do its work, for the approaches to the city were all in the hands of the Spaniards, and as the towns of the lake were either friendly or overawed by the great army of their allies, even the canoes, which at first made their way in at night with provisions, had ceased to steal across in the darkness. The great native levies were of little use to the Spaniards in the absolute fighting, but they did good service by overawing the towns, making expeditions against the tribes that had not yet consented to throw in their lot with the invaders, and by sweeping in provisions from a wide extent of country. But to wait until famine did its work little suited the spirit of the Spaniards. The process would assuredly be a long one, for men who fought so stoutly would resist starvation with equal tenacity. Besides, the duration of the siege was already beginning to excite discontent among the Allies, whose wars were generally of very short duration. The Spaniards, too, were suffering from severe illness brought on by fatigue, exposure, and hardship. It was now determined to make a grand effort to obtain possession of the great market of Tlatelolco, which lay on the northwestern part of the city. Its possession would enable the force of Cortez to join hands with those of Alvarado and Sandoval, and the spacious market itself, with its halls and porticos, would furnish accommodation for the army and enable them to attack the city at close quarters instead of having to fight their way every day along the causeway sandoval was to join alvarado sending seventy picked troops to support cortez advancing along the causeway and supported not only by the ships but by a countless host of canoes filled with the allies of the lake cities who penetrated the canals and caused confusion in the rear of the aztecs the division of cortez cleared the suburbs of their opponents and then advanced towards the square of tlatelolco by three great streets alderete commanded the force that advanced by the main central avenue this was a raised causeway with canals running on either side of the road tapia and a brother of alvarado commanded one of the other columns while cortez led the third a small body of cavalry with three guns remained in reserve in the great street leading to the causeway and here the column were to rally in case of disaster 
the three columns advanced simultaneously the spanish pressed the aztecs back before them their allies filled up the canals as they took them one by one the tlascalans stormed the houses and attacked the enemy on their roofs while the canoes engaged those of the aztecs and so prevented them from interfering with the men occupied in filling up the breaches the parallel streets were near enough to each other for the spaniards to hear the shouts of their companions in the other columns and to know that all were gaining ground steadily the enemy in the streets fought with less obstinacy than usual and cortez with his usual keen-sightedness at once apprehended that the feebleness of the resistance indicated some device and that the aztecs were allowing them to advance only to lead them into a trap he had received a message from aldoretta saying that he was getting on fast and that he was but a short distance from the great square fearing that this officer eager to be the first to gain the market-place was not taking proper precautions to secure his retreat cortez with a small body of troops retraced his steps and turned up the street by which aldoretta's column had advanced he had gone but a short distance when he saw that his stringent orders had been neglected for he came upon an opening some thirty feet wide full of water at least twelve feet deep a slight attempt only had been made to stop the gap and stones and timber lying by the side showed that it had been abandoned as soon as commenced the general saw too that the road had been narrowed as it approached this point and that the work had evidently been recently done much alarmed at the consequence of this neglect he at once set his men to fill up the breach but they had scarcely begun the operation when a terrific yell arose drowning the mingled clamor of the distant conflict aldoretta had as cortez supposed pressed on the retreating aztecs with too great eagerness he had carried the barricades which defended the breach and had given orders that the chasm should be filled up but in their eagerness to be first in the square the spaniards had pressed on none caring to stop to see that the allies carried out the order so taking position after position they pressed on until they were close to the square suddenly the horn of guatimozin the emperor sent forth a piercing note from the summit of a temple as if by magic the retreating aztecs turned and fell on their pursuers while swarms of warriors from the adjoining streets lanes and corners attacked the advancing column taken completely by surprise bewildered by the suddenness and fury of the onslaught appalled by the terrific war yells smitten down by the rain of missiles from the aztecs the spaniards fell into confusion and were swept down the street like foam on the crest of a wave in vain their leaders attempted to rally them their voices were drowned in the din and their followers panic-stricken now thought only of preserving their lives on they came until they reached the edge of the cut here some plunged in others were pushed in by the pressure from behind those who could swim were pulled down by their struggling comrades some got across and tried to climb the slippery side of the dike but fell back and were seized by the aztecs whose canoes now dashed up and added to the confusion by hurling a storm of missiles into the crowd cortez with his little party kept his station on the other side of the breach they were already surrounded by aztecs who had landed on the causeway behind them but held their ground desperately and endeavored as far as possible to assist their comrades to climb out of the water cortez was speedily recognized and storms of missiles were poured upon him but these glanced harmlessly from his helmet and armor six of the aztecs threw themselves upon him together and made a desperate effort to drag him into their boat in the struggle he received a severe wound in the leg and fell Olid, one of his followers, sprang to his rescue, severed the arm of one of the natives, and ran another through the body, and, being joined by a comrade named Lerma and by a Tlascalan chief, stood over the body of Cortez and drove off his foes, dispatching three more of his assailants. But Olid fell, mortally wounded, by the side of his leader. 
quinones the captain of the guard with several of his men now fought his way up lifted cortez from the water and laid him on the road one of his pages brought up his horse but fell wounded in the throat by a javelin guzman the chamberlain then seized the bridle and held it while cortez was helped into the saddle but was himself seized by the aztecs and carried off in a canoe cortez wounded as he was would still have fought on but quinones taking his horse by the bridle turned it to the rear exclaiming that his leader's life was too important to the army to be thrown away there the mass of fugitives poured along the causeway the road was soft and was so cut up that it was knee-deep in mud and in some places the water of the canals beside it met across it those on the flanks were often forced by the pressure down the slippery sides and were instantly captured and carried off by the canoes of the enemy cortez's standard-bearer was among those who fell in the canal but he succeeded in recovering his footing and saved the standard at last the fugitives reached the spot where the cannon and cavalry had been placed in reserve here cortez rallied them and charged the aztecs with the little body of horse while the artillery opened a hot fire upon them he then sent orders to the other two columns to fall back and when these had rejoined him the division retired cortez covering the movement with the cavalry as soon as they were freed from the city tapia was sent round on horseback to acquaint the other commanders of the failure they had advanced at the same time as cortez and had on their side nearly gained the square when they too were startled by the blast of guatimozin's horn and by the terrible yell that followed it then they heard the sound of battle which had before been clearly audible roll away in the distance and knew that the division of cortez had been driven back in a short time the attack upon themselves increased in fury as the troops who had been engaged with cortez returned and joined in the attack upon them two or three bloody heads were thrown among them with shouts of malinzin although sandoval and alvarado did not credit the death of their commander they felt that it was useless to persevere and indeed were unable to withstand the furious assaults of the aztecs with great difficulty they drew off their troops to the entrenchment on the causeway and here the guns of the ships sweeping the road drove back their assailants the greatest anxiety prevailed as to the fate of cortez until tapia arrived bleeding from several wounds which he had received from parties of men whom guatimozin had stationed to interrupt the communication between the two camps sandoval at once rode round he too was attacked on the road but his armor and that of his horse protected him from the missiles showered upon them on arriving at the camp he found the troops much dispirited numbers had been killed and wounded and no less than sixty-two spaniards with a multitude of allies had fallen into the hands of the enemy indeed the column around aldereta had been almost entirely destroyed and two guns and seven horses had been lost cortez explained to his follower the cause of the disaster and showed sandoval that as he should be unable to take the field for a few days he must take his place and watch over the safety of the camps roger hawkshaw had borne his full share in the desperate conflicts that had taken place in the previous combats he had fought only to preserve his own life but now he was eager for the fray his friend cuitcatl and his promised bride were prisoners in mexico and he fought now to deliver them it was nearly a year from the time when he had first retreated along the fatal causeway and in that time his frame had broadened out and his strength increased and so terrible were the blows he dealt that cortez himself had several times spoken to him in terms of approval of his valor and had appointed him to be one of his own bodyguard he had stood beside him at the edge of the breach and had done good service there you fight like a paladin cortez said as roger cut down three natives who had rushed upon him but see sancho put up your sword for a minute 
and take up that pike. If you hand the end to those poor fellows in the water, your strength will be sufficient to haul them up. Roger at once set to at the work of saving life, and dragged more than a score of men who would otherwise have been drowned. He heard the cry which was raised when Cortez was attacked, and throwing down his pike and drawing his sword, turned to rush to his assistance. But at this moment two Mexicans threw themselves upon him. His foot slipped in the mud, and in another moment he and his two assailants were rolling down the deep bank into the water. With a mighty effort he freed himself from their grasp, and, gaining the bank, tried to climb up. But a canoe dashed up alongside, a dozen Mexicans threw themselves upon him, and, with a triumphant shout, drew him into the boat, which at once paddled off from the scene of conflict. Roger, as he lay at the bottom of the canoe, felt that all hope was over. He knew that the Aztecs never spared a captive taken in war, and that all who fell into their hands were destined for the altars of their gods. He regretted deeply that he had not fallen in battle, but determined that, at any rate, he would not die tamely, and resolved that, rather than be slaughtered in cold blood on the altar when the time came, he would offer so desperate a resistance that they would be forced to kill him. Passing along several canals, the canoe stopped at some stairs. Roger was taken out and led through a shouting crowd to a great temple, where he was thrust into a prison room already occupied by several Spaniards. Their numbers increased until they amounted to twenty. Few words were spoken among the prisoners. Their arms were free, but their legs firmly secured with ropes, and ten armed Aztecs kept watch over them, to see that they made no attempt to unfasten their bonds. One of the prisoners, Roger saw, to his regret, was his friend Juan, he was severely wounded in several places, as indeed was Roger himself, although in the excitement of the battle he had scarce noticed it. "'Well, lad,' the old soldier said, "'this is a bad ending of our gold-seeking. Who would have thought that it was to be one's lot, first to be murdered on the altars of a hideous god, and then to furnish a meal to a race of savages?' "'The furnishing the meal does not trouble me,' Roger replied whether one is drowned and eaten by fishes, or killed and eaten by Aztecs, makes, as far as I can see, but little difference to one. However, I don't quite make up my mind to the worst yet, Juan. They must have captured a great number of us, for I saw many carried off who are not here, besides a multitude of Tlascalans and our other allies. I do not suppose they will sacrifice us all at once, but are likely to take so many a day. In that case, we may have the luck to be among the last, and before our turn comes, the Spaniards may be masters of the town. Juan shook his head. It is just as well to hope, lad, but I think the chances are next to nothing. Even if Cortez himself gets out safe, and the troops draw off without much further loss, it will be some days before they will attack again after such a maiming as we got this time. Even then, their chances of success will be no better than they were today. Worse, in fact, for we have lost something like a sixth of our force, beside what may have fallen in the attack from the other side. Put it at a quarter altogether. Our natives will be dispirited by their defeat today, and the Aztecs will have gained in confidence." by St. James, but those fellows fight well. Who would have thought when we saw them bowing and smiling when we first arrived in the city, and submitting so meekly to everything, that they would fight like fiends? Never did I see men so reckless of life. Pedro has fallen. I loved him as a son, but far better dead than here. I am sorry indeed to hear that he has fallen, Juan. I feared that he had, for he would not have let you be captured had he been alive. I don't give up all hope for ourselves. The Mexicans fight like heroes, but in the end we must win in spite of their valor. Even if we do not take the town by storm, which I don't think we ever should do, if it were provisioned, we shall take it by hunger. They must be well-nigh starving now. In another month 
there will not be a soul alive in the city. You do not think there is any chance of our making our escape? Not unless wings could sprout out from our shoulders, Juan said, and we could fly through the air. You may be sure these fellows will keep too sharp a lookout upon us to give us the shadow of a chance. Besides, if we were to get out, we could not go on foot without being detected. You might manage, lad, with a dark night to hide your color, and with the aid of a native dress, for you can speak their tongue. But as for me, the idea is hopeless, and not to be thought of. No, no, lad, I do not delude myself. My time has come, and I shall bear it, I hope, like a man and a Christian. From time to time, Aztecs came in to see that the prisoners were safe. From their conversation with the guards, Roger gathered that the attack had everywhere failed, and that the Spaniards had retired to their camps. Late in the afternoon some priests entered. Two of the prisoners were selected by them, their bonds cut, and they were taken away. Soon afterwards the sound of the great war drum reverberated through the city. The Spaniards in their camps started arms on hearing the sound, but they were not long in understanding its meaning, for from their camps they beheld a great procession winding up the principal pyramid. Alvarado's camp, which was the nearest to the city, was a short mile away from the temple, and in the clear evening air the troops could see that there were five or six white figures among them. As usual, the victims were decorated with plumes of feathers, to do honor to their own sacrifice. They were driven along with blows, and when they reached the summit of the temple, were seized and thrown, one by one, upon their backs upon the sacrificial stone, which was convex, so as to give a curve to their bodies. The principal priest then, with a sharp stone knife, cut through the skin and flesh between two of the ribs, and plunging his hand into the orifice, dragged out the heart, which he presented to the figure of the god. The sight, distant as it was, excited the Spaniards to the verge of madness, and if it had not been for their officers they would have seized their weapons and rushed forward again to the attack to avenge the murder of their comrades. The feelings of the captives, as they heard the sound of the drums, the shouts of the natives, and once or twice caught the scream of agony of their comrades, were terrible. This was the fate that they, too, were to undergo, and men who had a hundred times looked death in battle in the face shuddered and trembled at their approaching doom. Each day two of their number were taken, and the same terrible scene was gone through. Roger was rather surprised that he himself was not one of the first selected, as his height and figure made him specially conspicuous among his comrades. But he supposed that he was being one of those reserved for some special festival. Whatever the famine might be in the city, the captives were well fed, for it was a point of honor among the Aztecs that all victims offered to the gods should be in good health and condition. The guards were changed every six hours, and on the third day, in the officer over the relief, Roger recognized, to his surprise and delight, his friend Bethalda. The latter, as he entered, made a significant motion to Roger, as he caught his eye, to make no sign that he recognized him. The Aztecs, as usual, sat down in groups, chatting. They had no fear whatever of the prisoners attempting to escape in the daytime, and it was only at night that they exercised any special vigilance in seeing that they did not attempt to unloose their bonds. Bethalda presently sauntered up into the corner in which Roger was sitting. "'How are my friends?' the latter asked in a low voice. "'Well,' Bethalda replied, Cuitcatl explained to the young emperor the circumstances under which he came to know and assist you, and was at once restored to favor, and now commands a large body of troops here. I have not seen the princess. She is at the palace. Cuitcatl bade me tell you that they are working for you, and will rescue you before the time comes for your sacrifice, but at present the watch is too strict. But I may be chosen any day, Roger said. Bethalda shook his head. Cuitcatl has bribed the priests who choose the victims to leave you until the last, so you need not feel uneasiness on that score. 
be patient and watchful if any of your guard approach you and say the time is at hand you will know that he is a friend act as he tells you i dare not say more now ten days passed juan had gone and roger had been much moved at parting with him more so indeed than the old soldier himself who had kept up firmly and was prepared to meet his fate with contempt for his enemies in the assurance that his death would be terribly avenged bathalda had not reappeared as the number of prisoners had decreased the guard had been diminished and as there now only remained roger and one other and both were still bound a single aztec relieved the two who had the night before kept guard he stood indifferently gazing through the loophole until roger's companion fell asleep then he approached him and said the time is at hand to-morrow the other will be taken the number will be made up from the other prisons at night cuitcatl will be outside the door here will not be bolted you will have but one man to watch you but we know not whom he may be and may not be able to arrange with him if we do he will give you the password if not you must deal with him the man who will follow me is in the secret you must unfasten your ropes while he is here and he will aid you to do them up again so that while to the eye they will seem secure they can be shaken off instantly bathalda and another will accompany you i do not know who the other is but i was told that you would understand that other roger felt sure must be amentia and his heart beat hotly at the thought that his dear princess would share his flight the hours passed quickly the next day the last spaniard was taken and no sooner had he been forced struggling and resisting from the chamber than the guard who since he had taken up his post four hours before had made no sign to roger gave the password agreed upon the latter rose to his feet and with the aid of the native unfastened the cords that bound his ankles together for half an hour he paced up and down the chamber to restore the circulation to his feet then the guard replaced the cords but did it in such a way that though they seemed as tight and secure as before they would at a slight effort fall off and leave him free at eight o'clock in the evening the guard was relieved he had told roger that he was to listen for the cry of an owl outside twice repeated and that upon hearing this he would know that his friends were without roger listened anxiously for the password from his new guard but as it did not come he concluded that cuitcatl had not been able to bribe him and that he must himself overpower the man the aztec placed himself at the loophole and stood looking out turning from time to time to see by the light of the torch which was fixed close to where roger was lying that he was making no attempt to release himself from his bonds it was not until nearly midnight that roger heard the expected signal no sooner was the second call given than he pulled the knot which kept the cords together raised himself noiselessly to his feet and sprang upon the aztec taken by surprise the man was no more than a child in roger's strong grasp in a moment he was thrown down his cloth was twisted round his mouth so as to prevent any cry from escaping him and his arms were bound behind him with roger's rope roger then took his sword and javelin and went to the door as he had been told would be the case the outer bolts were unfastened passing along a passage he came to the outside gate this was securely fastened but roger had no difficulty in scaling the roof of a building leaning against the outer wall and on reaching this he pulled himself up and dropped down into the street beyond three persons were standing at the gate and he at once made towards them one ran forward with a little cry and threw herself into his arms the others were as he had expected cuitcatl and bathalda the former saluted him warmly thank the gods you are free roger he said i have a canoe close at hand for you bathalda will accompany you and the princess i cannot leave i am an aztec and shall fight until the last with our brave young emperor 
I hope, Cuitcatl, that when the resistance is over, as it must be before long, for I know from the talk of the guards that famine is among you, and that hundreds are dying daily, I hope that I may be able to aid you, as you are aiding me. I care not to live, Cuitcatl said. The empire is lost. But there is no dishonor in that, Roger replied. No men could defend themselves more bravely than you have done, and there is no disgrace in being vanquished by superior arms. I trust that you may live and be happy yet. Let us not stand here talking, the young cazique said. It is not as it was before. Then you might walk through the city at midnight without meeting with a single person. We sleep no longer now, but make nightly attacks on the Spaniards, and at any moment bodies of troops may come along. The little party moved forward, and in a minute descended the steps. Bethalda took his place in a small canoe lying there. Here is a weapon which will suit you better than that sword and javelin, he said, handing him a war club, a heavy weapon, with pieces of sharp-pointed obsidian fixed in it. Roger helped Amentia into the canoe, wrung Cuitcatl warmly by the hand, and then stepped in. Go, the latter exclaimed, I can hear troops approaching. So saying, he bounded swiftly away. Bethalda sat listening for a moment to discover the direction from which the troops were coming. As soon as he made out the soft tread of the shoeless feet, he dipped his paddle in the water, and the boat glided noiselessly away. It was not long before they emerged from the narrow waterway onto the lake, and then the boat's head was turned in the direction in which lay the Tlacopan causeway. Presently Amentia, who had been sitting nestled close to Roger, too happy even to speak, sat up and said, Hush! Bethalda ceased rowing. There is a large canoe coming up behind us, he said, listening intently. I can hear others on the lake beyond us. We had better make into the shore again, Roger said, and let them pass us. The canoe, however, was not very far behind, and those on board caught sight of the little craft as she rowed in toward shore. It was unusual to see so small a boat at night. The idea that it might contain a spy occurred to them, and they shouted to them to stop. Bethalda exerted himself to the utmost, but the canoe came rapidly up to them. As the command to stop was again disregarded, a volley of javelins was discharged. We cannot escape, Bethalda said. They will be upon us before we can land. Cease rowing, Roger said. Amentia, lie still, dear, at the bottom of the boat. I will deal with them. Seeing that the oarsmen had stopped paddling, the volley of javelins ceased, and the canoe, which contained some twenty men, ran alongside. As she did so, Roger sprang on board her. Three or four of the natives were struck down in an instant with his terrible weapon. The others, as soon as they recovered from their astonishment, rose from their seats and attacked him. Their numbers were but of slight avail. Standing in the bow of the boat and swinging his weapon round his head, Roger kept them off, beating down one each time his weapon fell. In vain they tried to close with him. His great size, and the suddenness with which he had attacked them, acted upon their superstitious fears. They knew not what sort of being it was with whom they had to deal, and the terrible strength displayed, and the instant fate that fell on all who approached him, appalled them. Roger soon took the offensive, and, making his way along the boat, drove them back before him. At last, when more than half their number had fallen, the rest sprang overboard and swam to the shore. Roger had been wounded by three or four spear thrusts, but these had been too hastily given to penetrate very deeply. "'I am unhurt, Amentia,' he said, making his way forward again and stepping into the canoe. There was no reply. He stooped over as she lay quietly there. "'She has fainted,' he said. "'Row on, Bethalda. You had best give me the other paddle. I can hear boats coming in this direction. No doubt they heard the yells. Skirt along the shore. We shall be unseen, close in, and if they approach us, can take refuge in a canal. But they passed along unnoticed. When they caught sight of the causeway, stretching away dimly in front of them, 
they again rowed out into the lake and making a long circuit to avoid the canoes attacking zolak the guns of which were firing hotly came down on the causeway again in its rear they were hailed as they approached for the spaniards were all under arms roger shouted that he was a friend who had escaped from the prison and the spaniards in return gave a shout of welcome in another two minutes the canoe lay alongside the causeway bathalda sprang on shore and held the canoe while roger lifted amentia up and stepped out a dozen hands were held out to assist him to climb the slippery bank his figure was known by them all many exclamations of welcome greeted him and many were the inquiries as to the other captives i will tell you all about it directly bring the torch a little closer i have a lady here who has fainted we were attacked as we came out the fight was a sharp one and has scared her a soldier brought a torch and as he did so roger uttered a loud cry amentia's face was bloodless and her eyes were closed but it was not this that had caused roger's cry there was a dark stain on her white dress and in its centre the feathered head of an arrow while bathalda and roger had escaped the missiles with which those in the boat heralded their attack an arrow had struck amentia as she turned when roger sprang on board so great was roger's horror that he reeled and would have fallen had not the soldier standing round supported him i think that she has but fainted from loss of blood bathalda said and roger refusing all assistance carried amentia to the fort through the ranks of the spaniards who were engaged hotly with their assailants in the canoes he bore her at once to the chamber occupied by marina she was up and dressed for the attack was a hot one and there was no sleep in zolak she uttered a cry of welcome and gladness as roger entered i have escaped malincha he said but i fear that she has died in saving me i have brought her to you as you are the only woman here marina took the girl tenderly and laid her on a couch i will see to her she said softly leave her to me roger as roger blinded with tears left the room an officer met him at the door and told him that cortez had just heard of his arrival and desired his presence the general received him with great kindness it is something to see one of my comrades back again sancho he said i hear how sad a misfortune has befallen you for i suppose the lady you brought ashore was she of whom marina spoke to me she told me that she did not give up all hope that you might return for that the princess whom you loved was in the city and would she was sure do all that she could to save your life she did so general roger said and i fear at the cost of her own she and a noble young cazique who was a brother to me when i was living at tezcuco i will not trouble you now with questions cortez said but tell me do you know whether any of the other prisoners are alive every evening we have marked that terrible procession to the summit of the temple fifty-eight have been sacrificed but we know not exactly how many more remain being ignorant which of our comrades fell and which were captured i cannot tell roger replied i was the only one left out of twenty who were in prison together if they were taken in the same proportion from the other prisons there can be but a few remaining now i was set aside until the last because the priest who had daily chosen out the victims had been bribed by my friend cuitcatl roger hastened away as soon as cortez dismissed him and hurried back to malinche's apartment her mexican attendant who was standing outside the door opened it when she saw him approaching and as she came up malincha stole out with her finger on her lips we have taken out the arrow she said she is still insensible but the leech thinks that it is from loss of blood and hopes that no vital point has been injured more than that he cannot say at present you had best have your own wounds attended to now i will have a pile of rugs laid for you in this little room to the left and will let you know if any change takes place do you think that there is any hope malincha malincha shook her head i know not roger 
i have already sent off to the mainland to fetch a leech famous for his skill in the use of herbs our people have many simples of which you know nothing in europe and they are very skilful in the treatment of wounds much more so i think than the white men end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of with cortez in mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. With Cortez in Mexico by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 22. Home. After having had his wounds dressed, Roger threw himself down upon the bed that had been prepared for him, and lay tossing for hours. Hitherto he had believed, and had often reproached himself for it, that he had not loved Amentia as she had loved him. She had loved him with the passion and devotion of the people of her race, and it was no figure of speech when she said that she was ready to give her life for him. Roger knew that, until lately, his love had been poor by the side of hers. From the time he had sailed from England to his first meeting with her, he had pictured to himself that some day, when he came to command a ship of his own he would marry his cousin if she had borne him in mind since he parted with her on plymouth hoe this dream had faded away from the time he had first met amentia and when cacama had proposed the marriage to him he had accepted the offer gladly his chance of ever leaving the country at that time seemed slight and he felt sure that he should be happy with amentia since that time the girl's frank expression of her love for him her tender devotion and her willingness to sacrifice country and people and all to throw in her lot with him had greatly heightened the feeling he had towards her and he had come to love her truly but still perhaps rather with the calm earnest affection of a brother than the passionate devotion of a lover but now he knew that she had his whole heart if she died it seemed of little consequence to him what became of his life it was for his sake that she had risked everything had left all friends and home and country and he felt that he would gladly die with her morning was breaking before malintia came into his room she is sensible she said and my countryman who is with her thinks that she will live. The relief was so great that Roger burst into tears. "'Come with me,' Malincha said, taking his hand. "'We do not think she knows what has happened, but she looks anxiously about the room. She is very, very weak, but the leech thinks that if she sees you and knows that you are safe and well, it will rouse her and put her in the way of recovery. You must not talk to her or excite her in any way." Roger followed Malincha into her room. Amentia was lying, without a vestige of color on her face, and with her eyes closed, and her breathing so faint that Roger, as he looked at her, thought that she was dead. "'Take her hand and kneel down beside her,' Malincha whispered. Roger took the girl's hand. As he did so, a slight tremor ran through her, as if she recognized his touch. Then her eyes opened. "'Amentia, my darling, do you know me?' Roger said, as he stooped his face close to hers. Her face brightened suddenly, and a look of intense happiness came into her eyes. "'Oh, Roger,' she whispered, "'I dreamed that they had killed you. I am safe and well, as you see,' he said. "'They have hurt you, darling, but you will get better, and we shall be happy together. You must not talk, but I may stay by you, if you will keep quiet. Drink this first, and he handed to her a cup that the Mexican doctor held out to him, and, placing his arm under Amentia's head, raised it and poured the liquid between her lips. Then he laid her head down again on the pillow, and, kneeling beside her, held her hand in his. She lay looking up into his face with an expression of quiet happiness, occasionally murmuring, "'Dear Roger!' 
presently her eyelids drooped and in a few minutes her regular breathing showed that she was asleep the mexican doctor placed another cup of medicine within roger's reach and murmured in his ear i think that she will do now give her this when she awakes i shall be within call if i am wanted amentia slept for some hours and roger overcome by want of sleep and from the anxiety through which he had passed dropped off many times into short dozes he woke from one of these at a slight movement of amentia's hand and opened his eyes at the moment that she was opening hers what has happened roger and where am i she asked in wonder first drink this medicine and then i will tell you he said you remember dear we were in the boat together and we were attacked an arrow struck you but i knew nothing about it until i had reached the causeway and found you senseless and brought you here to malinche's room and she and one of the doctors of your country dressed your wound and now you have been sleeping quietly for some hours oh yes she said i remember now i was struck with an arrow it was a sharp pain but i did not cry out for you had need of all your strength and vigor i lay there quietly and heard the din of fighting and at last when i knew that you had conquered i felt a faintness stealing over me and thought that i was dying and then i remember nothing more only it seemed that in my dreams you came to me and knelt by the side of me and kissed me and now i know that that part is true and i have been having such happy dreams ever since but why should i lie here cannot i get up no dear you are weak from loss of blood and quiet is necessary lie here a minute i will fetch the leech in to see how you are the mexican was sleeping on some mats outside the door he at once came in and after examining amentia pronounced her decidedly better malinche who had given orders that she was to be informed as soon as the princess was awake came in a minute or two and a consultation was held when it was decided that amentia should at once be taken from the fort which was crowded with soldiers as well as exposed to the din and turmoil of the night attacks malinche went out and soon returned saying that she had spoken to one of the tezcucan caziques in alliance with the spaniards he had at once offered to receive amentia at his palace which was situate but three miles from the end of the causeway i cannot leave roger again the princess said when she understood what was proposed there is no thought of your leaving him malinche said kindly roger is to accompany you he needs rest and peace almost as much as you do besides he has been seriously wounded though he makes light of it the cazique has sent off a messenger for a party of his people to meet you a boat will be in readiness to take you across the lake at sunset you will be carried in litters from the landing place to his palace this program was carried out and by nine o'clock that evening roger and amentia were both settled in luxurious apartments in the cazique's palace cortez now recovered from his wounds prepared for a fresh advance which was this time to be conducted in a different manner against so stubborn and active a foe the advance must be irresistible steady and continued in future no step backward was to be taken every breach every canal was to be filled up so firmly and solidly that it could never again be disturbed and for this purpose every building whether a private house temple or palace was to be demolished it was with the greatest reluctance that cortez arrived at this determination he would fain have saved the city intact as the most glorious trophy of his success but his experience showed him that with every house a fortress every street cut up by canals it was hopeless to expect to conquer it the indian allies heard his intention with the greatest satisfaction for there was ever in their mind the dread that should the white men depart the aztecs would take a terrible revenge upon their rebellious subjects enormous numbers of men were assembled and provided with implements for the work this was steadily carried out 
until the whole of the suburbs were leveled and a wide space round the city left open for the manoeuvres of the cavalry and the play of the artillery before making the last attack cortez tried once more to persuade the emperor to yield and sent three aztec nobles who had been captured in one of the late fights to bear a message to him he told guatimozin that he and his people had done all that brave men could and that there remained no hope no chance of escape their provisions were exhausted their communications cut off their vassals had deserted them and the nations of anahuac were banded against them he prayed him therefore to have compassion on his brave subjects who were daily perishing before his eyes and on the fair city now fast crumbling into ruins he begged him to acknowledge his allegiance to the sovereign of spain in which case he should be confirmed in his authority and the persons the property and all the rights of the aztecs should be respected the young monarch would have instantly refused the terms but he called a council to deliberate upon them many would have accepted them but the priests threw all their influence in the scale against it reminding the king of the fate of montezuma after all his hospitality to the whites of the seizure and imprisonment of Kakama, of the massacre of the nobles of the profanation of the temple and of the insatiable greed that had stripped the country of its treasures the answer to the spaniards was given in the form of a tremendous sortie along each causeway but the guns of the spanish batteries and ships drove the assailants back and the operations of destruction went on day by day the army of workers leveled the houses and filled the canals although the mexicans made incessant attacks upon the troops who covered the workmen for several weeks the work continued while the wretched inhabitants were fast wasting away with hunger all the food stored up had long since been consumed and the population reduced to feed on roots dug up in the gardens on the bark of trees leaves and grass and on such rats mice and lizards as they could capture the houses as the besiegers advanced were found to be full of dead while in some lay men women and children in the last stage of famine and yet weakened and suffering as they were the aztecs maintained their resolution rejecting every overture of cortez at last the division of alvarado cleared its way into the great square and a party mounting the great temple where so many of their comrades had been massacred defeated the aztecs who guarded the position slaughtered the priests and set fire to the sanctuary and the next day the division of cortez won their way to the same spot and joined that of alvarado seven-eighths of the city was now destroyed and with the exception of the king's palace and a few temples all the buildings that had when they first saw it so excited the admiration of the spaniards and had made the city one of the loveliest in the world had been leveled in the portion that remained the whole of the aztec population were crowded their number was still vast for before the siege began the people from many of the surrounding cities had flocked into the capital pestilence was aiding famine in its work and the spanish writers say that as the troops advanced the bodies lay so thick that it was impossible to walk without treading on them again and again cortez endeavored to negotiate with the emperor although so reduced by weakness that they could scarce keep their feet the aztecs maintained their defiant attitude and the advance of the allies recommenced the aztecs fought as bravely as ever but they were so weakened that their missiles were no longer dangerous and their arms could scarce lift their weapons it was a dreadful carnage the confederates panting with hatred of the race that had subdued and so long humiliated them showed no pity and even when cortez ordered that quarter should be shown to all who asked it the allies refused to be checked and the work of slaughter went on until the spanish trumpet sounded a retreat during that day alone it was calculated that forty thousand persons had fallen 
that night a mournful stillness reigned over the city in silent despair and yet with no thought of surrender the aztecs awaited their fate the next morning august fifteenth fifteen twenty one the troops were formed up again but before ordering the advance cortez obtained an interview with some of the principal chiefs and persuaded them to see the emperor and try to induce him to surrender but the answer came that guatimozin was ready to die where he was and would hold no parley with the spanish commander cortez still postponed the assault for several hours then finding delay unavailing he reluctantly gave the order for the attack to recommence as upon the previous day it was a mere slaughter many of the aztecs sought to fly in canoes but these were cut off by the fleet presently however while the butchery was still going on the welcome news was brought that guatimozin himself had been captured by one of the vessels with him was his wife the beautiful princess tecuicpo a daughter of montezuma and twenty nobles of high rank the news of his capture spread rapidly through the fleet and city and the feeble resistance the aztecs still offered ceased at once guatimozin was brought before cortez and behaved with a dignity and calmness that excited the admiration and respect of the general and his followers the next morning at the emperor's request cortez gave permission for all the survivors of the siege to leave the town and issued strict orders both to the spaniards and their savage allies that no insult or injury should be offered to them for three days sad processions of men women and children worn out with fatigue wasted with fever and hunger and in many cases scarred with wounds made their way along the causeways the number of men alone was variously estimated at from thirty to seventy thousand the losses during the siege were also placed at varying figures by contemporary writers the lowest estimate was one hundred and twenty thousand while some writers placed it at double that amount the higher figures probably approximate most nearly to the truth for the population of the city in itself very large was enormously swelled by the vast number of persons from all the surrounding cities who took refuge there at the approach of the spaniards the spanish loss was comparatively small the larger portion of it being incurred upon the day of the destruction of alderetta's column the loss of the allies however was very large as they were not provided as were the spaniards with armor which defied the missiles of the enemy of the tezcucans alone it is said that thirty thousand perished the amount of booty taken in the city was comparatively small and the army was bitterly disappointed at the poor reward which it reaped for its labors and sacrifices there can be no doubt that the aztec treasures were removed and buried before the approach of the spaniards to the city indeed during the siege the aztecs constantly taunted them with shouts that even if they ever took the city they would find no gold there to reward their efforts the defense of the city of mexico has been frequently likened to that of jerusalem against titus in each case a vast population ignorant of the arts of war resisted with heroic constancy the efforts of a civilized enemy and succumbed to hunger and disease rather than to the foe the fate of the aztecs befell them because while a conquering people they had enslaved and tyrannized over the nations they subdued extending to them no rights or privileges but using them simply as means of supplying the pomp and luxury of the capital and of providing men for its wars even the cities of the valley the near neighbors of mexico were kept in a galling state of dependence and the result was that the whole of the aztec empire broke up at once and fell upon its oppressors as soon as the coming of the spaniards afforded them the opportunity for retaliation and revenge had it not been for this it would have needed a force many times as numerous as that of cortez to conquer an empire so extensive and populous and composed of peoples so brave and fearless of death 
terrible as the destruction of life was in the capture of mexico the spaniards were not open to blame for it except in the massacre of the nobles for which conduct cortez was in no way responsible the war was not conducted with the cruelty that too often distinguished the warfare of the spaniards cortez had certainly no desire to destroy the beautiful capital of the country he had conquered for spain the prisoners taken during the siege and the people who came out and surrendered were always treated with kindness even when the spaniards were maddened by the sight of the daily sacrifices of their countrymen by the aztecs again and again during the siege cortez endeavored to induce the enemy to come to terms and after the fighting was over the whole of the survivors were permitted to depart unharmed a fortnight after the fall of mexico amentia and roger were both convalescent amentia's wound had after the first day caused but little anxiety she had fainted from loss of blood and from the effects of the long strain which she had undergone from the time that she had heard that roger was a captive in the hands of the mexicans and destined for sacrifice at the temple under the influence then of happiness and of the care and attention she received she was in two or three days well enough to get up and go into the adjoining room and sit by the couch of roger who was prostrated by fever the result of imprisonment anxiety and his wounds for a time his life was in danger but after the crisis had passed he too recovered rapidly malinche came several times to see them and a warm affection sprang up between her and amentia what do you mean to do roger she asked him one day when she found him alone i mean to marry amentia at once he said and to go back to europe if possible without delay i have managed that for you malinche said i spoke to cortez yesterday the city cannot resist many days longer and after that we hope that there will be no more fighting at any rate i told him that you were so shaken from what you had gone through it would be a long time before you would be fit to carry arms again and that you desired greatly to go to europe for a time and he has consented that you shall go down to the coast with the first convoy of wounded as soon as the city falls of course he has given consent for your marriage with amentia and said when i asked him that she had fairly won you he says that if you return hither he will give to amentia a wide portion of her brother's dominions i did not tell him that it was little likely he would ever see you out here again during the next fortnight roger instructed amentia in the outlines of the christian faith and the day before the convoy was to start three weeks after the fall of mexico father almedo received her into the church and the marriage ceremony took place it was attended by cortez and most of his leaders and by many of the native nobles among them roger was glad to meet cuitcatl he was one of the party who had been captured with the emperor and had been at once released by cortez when the latter was informed by malinche that he had befriended and released roger that evening the two friends had a long talk together you will be happy cuitcatl said and will come in time in your home in your own country to look back at this terrible time as a troubled dream i do not mourn for kakama or maclutha they are fortunate in escaping the troubles that yet remain for my unhappy country for i well foresee that the spaniards will gradually subdue those who have served them so well in their campaign against us their allies will in time become their subjects until the whole empire of the aztecs will lie prostrate at their feet but whatever happens i shall take no further part in it i have fought by the side of the aztecs against my own countrymen i have done my best to save our nation from falling under the dominion of the spaniards i shall retire now to my estates and devote myself to them cortez has given me a paper signed by him saying that i although fighting against him saved the life of a spanish prisoner who was the only one of those captured who escaped being sacrificed and that therefore 
he orders all Spaniards to treat me with kindness and consideration, and confirms to me and my heirs to all time the possession of my estates, free from all takes or imposts whatever. Malinche obtained this document from him, and has induced the treasurer and chamberlain also to affix their seals to it, and she says that it will be undoubtedly respected. As you know, Roger, I should long ago have married my cousin, who was one of Maclutha's ladies-in-waiting, but we deferred it until these troubles should be over. I have been to Tezcuco today, and we shall be married at the end of the week, so that I have every hope of leading a quiet and happy life, and think that, in the end, these troubles will tend to the happiness of the people of the country. As a Tezcucan, I can acknowledge that the Aztec tyranny was a heavy one, that the people were sorely oppressed. The wholesale sacrifices at the temples, now abolished forever, were the cause of constant wars, and I think that when the Spaniards once overcome all resistance and establish a firm and stable government, the people will be happier than they ever could have been under the Aztec rule. What has become of Bethalda? He accompanied us here, and then went off to your estates, saying that he should collect a few of his friends and occupy your house to see that none took advantage of the troubles to plunder it. I recommend him to your care, Cuitcatl. There is no occasion to do that, Roger. He has been a faithful servant and friend, and shall in future be my right hand. The next morning Malinche came to say farewell to them. How much has taken place in the last four years, Roger, she said. Then I was a slave girl. You were a captive in a strange country. What scenes we have passed through since then! I am sorry indeed that you are going, Roger, and the tears came into her eyes. You were my first friend, and I have loved you ever since as a brother. I shall miss you sorely indeed. However, I know that you and Amentia will be happy together. Princess, I have something of yours, and she held up a heavy girdle. Amentia gave a cry of joy. I missed it, she said, but I thought that it must have fallen off in the boat, or as Roger carried me thence to the castle. See, Roger, she said, holding it out to them, this is my dowry. I told you I should not come to you a penniless bride, but I have thought lately that I was mistaken. Maclutha, when she died, gave me all the jewels we carried away from the treasure room at Tezcuco. I selected all the most valuable ones and sewed them into this broad girdle, which I put on under my things on the night when you escaped. Its loss has grieved me, though you said that the two little bags you have already would suffice to make you rich. Still, they were Maclutha's, and I wanted to give you mine, but I could not think what had become of the belt. I found it on you, Amentia, when we loosened your robe to examine your wound, and put it by to give to you or Roger, whichever might recover, and now I am glad to hand it over as your joint property." I have already returned Roger his own two little bags that he had given me to take care of. And now farewell to you both. You will think of me sometimes in your distant home in England. And Malinche, bursting into tears, hurried away. The journey to the coast was an easy one, as the sick were all transported on litters carried by native porters. The bracing air of the high land did much to restore the strength of the sick men who had been suffering much from the terrible heat of the valley. The officer in command of the convoy halted them for a week on the Tlascalan plateau in order that they might get the full benefit of the cool air, and by the time they reached the coast and were carried on board ship, Roger felt his strength fast returning. A comfortable cabin was assigned to him and Amentia, as Cortez had at Malinche's request, written a letter specially commending them to the care of the officer in command of the ship. The voyage to Spain was a long one, and before the vessel arrived at Cadiz, Roger and Amentia were completely restored to health and strength. Roger's success, indeed, had been beyond his wildest hopes. 
the two bags of jewels and those which amentia had brought away with her would suffice to make him a very rich man he had too an assortment of the finest mexican stuffs which malentia had given him as a special present for his friends at home and he had a bar of gold of the value of a thousand pounds which was his share as one of cortez's bodyguard of the gold found at the capture of the capital he had learned from a vessel which was spoken as they neared spain that england and spain were in alliance against france and he had no doubt therefore that he should find english ships at cadiz his heart was gladdened as the vessel entered the port by seeing the english flag flying on several vessels in harbor as soon as roger and his companions landed they were surrounded by an eager crowd all anxious to learn more of the capture of mexico of which a swift vessel sent off as soon as the city fell had brought news six weeks earlier and roger had to tell the story of the siege a dozen times over as soon as he could get free from the crowd he went to a money changers and obtained spanish gold in exchange for his bar then he purchased at a clothier's a suit of garments of spanish fashion and putting these on was able to move about without attracting observation amentia did not disembark until after nightfall but roger's first care after landing was to purchase a chestful of garments fit for a spanish lady of rank and to send them out to the vessel having sent these off he made his way down to the port and inquiring among the sailors found that an english ship would sail on the following day hiring a boat he went on board he determined to maintain his character as a spaniard to the last as he would therefore avoid all questions and it was accordingly in that language that he arranged for a passage for himself and his wife the captain taking him for a spanish gentleman having business with the court in london having settled this roger returned on board and late in the evening was rowed with amentia to the english ship which was to sail early the next morning the wind was favorable and the ship made a quick passage the captain and sailors amused roger by their comments on his appearance never they agreed had they seen a spaniard of such size and strength before he stands six feet three if he is an inch an old sailor said and he is as broad as any man i ever saw he is never a bit like a spaniard in appearance with his blue eyes and light brown hair if you were to put him in good english broadcloth and teach him to talk like a christian no one would dream he was other than an englishman the spaniards generally have solemn faces but this chap looks as if he could laugh and joke with the best of us one could almost swear that he understood what i am saying now roger was several times tempted to say that he did understand but he kept his counsel as soon as they landed near london bridge they went to an inn and when the sailors who had carried his trunk for him had left he addressed the landlord in english can you direct me to a clothier where i can obtain suitable clothes he said i have been staying in spain and having been wrecked and lost all my outfit had to rig myself in spanish fashion i also wished to purchase clothing of english fashion for my wife i thought you were an englishman by your looks the landlord said though the fashion of your clothes was altogether foreign and you speak too with a strange accent for indeed roger found the english words come with difficulty after having for nearly six years spoken nothing but mexican and spanish i have been some time away he said and have been talking with the spaniards until i have well nigh forgotten my own tongue two hours later he was attired in the fashion of a well-to-do merchant and amentia made as he told her the prettiest wife merchant ever had they stayed for a week in london amentia being greatly amused and interested in all she saw at the end of that time having purchased a stout horse and a sword to defend himself against any robbers he might meet with on the way roger started to ride down to plymouth with amentia behind him on a pillion six days after leaving london they entered the town and roger 
having seen amentia comfortably bestowed at the principal inn took his way to the house of master diggory beggs the latter was in his shop and came forward bowing as roger entered it what can i do for you to-day good sir he said i have goods of all sorts and kinds italian work and spanish silks and satins and velvets i would have a talk with you alone master beggs i am the bearer of a message from an old friend of yours if you will grant me a few minutes talk we may do business together by all means the merchant said thinking that such an introduction offered some important transactions will you be good enough to follow me and he led the way upstairs dame mercy was sitting at work with her youngest daughter when they entered the room diggory saying please to leave dame this gentleman and i have business of importance to discuss together there is no occasion for you to leave us roger said my business is not so private but that you and mistress agnes may hear us you know my daughter's name dame beggs exclaimed in surprise the gentleman comes with a message from an old friend of ours diggory said and has doubtless heard him mention our daughter's name and dorothy roger asked she is well i hope my eldest daughter was married three months since dame mercy replied roger gave an exclamation of satisfaction and so none of you know me he asked and yet you are but little changed except that mistress agnes has grown into a young woman whereas she was but a child when i parted from her diggory beggs and his wife gazed at roger in astonishment agnes stood up with her hands tightly clasped together it is roger she cried oh mother it is roger come back to us i am roger sure enough aunt he said stooping and kissing her and then shaking hands with his uncle and kissing agnes and your father diggory asked and the swan it is a sad story roger said a very sad story uncle six years ago the swan was wrecked on the coast of tabasco and every soul save myself lost it was a blow for diggory beggs he had indeed long since given up all hope of ever seeing his cousin reuben or of obtaining any return for the capital he had embarked on the swan but the sight of roger had for a moment raised his hopes that the venture had after all been productive however he speedily recovered himself i am grieved to hear it roger though in no ways surprised for two years we looked for your return but we have all long since given up hope and written off our shares in the swan as lost money i am sorry for reuben very sorry for i loved him like a brother well well do not let us talk about it now you are restored to us safe and sound and though the loss was a heavy one and crippled me for a time i have got over it now tell us what have you been doing ever since and by what miracle have you returned safe and sound it is a long story uncle a very long story but before i begin it i may tell you that though the ship and its venture were lost i myself have returned by no means penniless and can indeed repay to the full all the money expended upon the swan and her outfit now i want you all to come round with me to the inn for there i have left a lady whom i would fain introduce to you your wife mistress mercy cried you don't say you have brought home a wife roger that do i aunt she is a princess in her own country but what is much better she is the dearest of women and all but gave her life to save mine mistress mercy looked grave and was about to speak when roger interrupted her i know what you are about to say aunt the thought of having a foreign woman for your niece is shocking to you never mind leave it unsaid until you have seen her but as we go let us call in and see dorothy and take her on with us i should wish her to be one of the first to welcome my wife dorothy was as astonished as the others had been when they arrived at her house with roger and cast a meaning glance at him when she heard that he had brought home a wife i know what you are thinking of dorothy our parting on the hoe dorothy laughed i meant it when i said it dorothy and meant it for a good time afterwards 
It was only when it seemed that I should never come back again that I fell in love with someone else, and when you have heard my story, and know what she did for me, and how much I owe her, and come to love her for herself, you won't blame me. I don't blame you one bit, Roger, she said, frankly. When you went away, we thought we cared for each other, but of course we were only boy and girl then, and when I grew up, and you did not come home, and it seemed that you never would come home, as you say, I fell in love with someone else. And now I will put on my hood and come round and see your wife. What is her name? Her name is Amentia, Roger said, and Amentia I mean to call her. When she was christened, for of course she had to be christened, before we were married, Father Almedo said she must have a Christian name, and christened her Katerina. But for all that her name is Amentia, and we mean to stick to it. But come along. She has been an hour alone in this strange place already, and must begin to think that I have run away from her. Dorothy and Agnes were at once won by the soft beauty of the dark-skinned princess, and when, that evening, Roger told the story of all that had taken place in Mexico, Dame Mercy's last prejudice vanished, and she took Amentia in her arms and kissed her tenderly. "'My dear,' she said, Roger has always been as a son to me, and henceforth you will be as one of my daughters. As to Diggory, his delight and satisfaction were almost too great for words. He was overjoyed that Roger had returned, vastly gratified that the money he expended on the swan was to be repaid, and greatly captivated by Amentia. The princess could speak but a few words of English, for Roger had been afraid to commence her tuition in that language until they were safely in England, but she was greatly pleased with the welcome she received, and began, for the first time, to feel that some day she might come to regard this strange country as home. There was a long talk between Roger and his uncle as to the steps that should be taken. It was agreed that, now Spain and England were so closely allied, it would be imprudent in the extreme to allow it to become known that the swan had sailed for the western Indies, or that Roger had obtained wealth there, for if it came to the ears of the court, and such strange news would travel fast, it might well be that a ruinous fine might be imposed upon all concerned in the matter. Therefore, it was arranged that nothing whatever should be said about it, but that it should be given out that the swan had been wrecked in foreign parts, and that Roger, who had been sole survivor of the wreck, had settled abroad and made money there, and had married a foreign lady. More than that, it would be unnecessary to tell. The gems could be sent over, a few at a time, to Amsterdam, and there sold to merchants, who would care nothing whence they came, and the partners of Diggory Beggs, in the venture of the swan, would be only too glad to receive their money back again, and to ask no questions as to how it had been obtained. And so matters were carried out. For some months Roger remained in nominal partnership with his uncle, and then bought a large estate a few miles out of the town, where he set up as a country gentleman. He was, for a time, somewhat shyly looked upon by the magistrates of the county, who deemed it an unheard-of thing for a Plymouth merchant thus to settle among them, but in time he was accepted, especially after it became known that, when he went up to town, he held his place among the highest there, and kept a state and expenditure equal to that of many of the nobles. His wife was remarkable, not only for her beauty, but for the richness of her jewels, many of which were fashioned in such a way such as had never before been seen at the English court. As time went on, and the relations between England and Spain grew cold, there was no longer any occasion for secrecy, and little by little it became known that the swan had sailed to the Spanish main, that Roger had formed one of the conquering band of Cortez, and that Amentia was not a Spaniard, but an Aztec princess. This caused a great talk at the time, and added much to the consideration in which Roger was held. He took a leading position in the country, and, many years after, fitted out two ships at his own cost, 
to fight against the Spanish Armada. Happily, Amentia's health never suffered from the change to the comparatively cold climate of Devonshire. She bore Roger several children, and to this day many of the first families in Devonshire are proud that there runs in their veins the blood of the Aztec princess. End of chapter 22 End of With Cortez in Mexico by George Alfred Henty